Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Liz Henriquez and I work in the recruitment department at George Brown College and I'm very happy to be joined by my colleagues from the School of Design and the admissions office to deliver this presentation to you today. But first I'm going to go over a few session tips before we get uh, into the main part of the presentation. Hopefully everyone can see the slides and hear me speaking. And I think most people said okay. Um, uh, just to give you a little uh, session into the Blackboard platform that we are using today, uh, when you see your screen, you should see a little purple um, half circle with two arrows. If you click there, it will open up the communications tab where you'll be able to see the chat, which most of you did. But for those of you who might, who did not respond and who aren't familiar with it, we usually just go through just uh, the little basics so everyone knows. Um, now, we have uh, disabled your microphones and your cameras. so. I'm only showing you my face for a little bit and then once I start the presentation I will be turning it off because it actually uh, makes for a better um, feed if you turn your uh, camera off. So we're going to get started and you will see a little function, a little, uh, little person with their hand raised. You don't need to use that uh, icon right now. At the end of the presentation we're going to have a question period. And that's when you can uh, be able to uh, ask any of your questions. So moving on, just to quickly go over the agenda. So I'm going to start off and give you some basic information about George Brown College, some fun facts that are interesting. And then I will deliver a brief overview of the School of Design. And then we're going to have four program spotlights that will be led by the coordinators and the chair of those areas. And at the end of the presentation, then we will have a quick um, question period. All right, so this is how it's going to go. So hopefully everybody's ready for the presentation. So I'm going to start off just by giving you a brief introduction of George Brown College. There we go. So George Brown College has been a leader in education for over 50 years and our students gain hands-on experience inside the classroom working along industry professionals or in applied research to develop and test new products. And in fact, George Brown has been ranked as a top college in Canada for its research. So it's important to uh, just um, let people know that there are a lot of opportunities for our students. The fact that we're in downtown Toronto gives them a great experience overall. I was born and raised in downtown Toronto, so I'm a big fan of our city. And uh, expert instructors, I mean, a college is nothing without the, um, the leaders that we have teaching the classrooms and working on various projects in research. And our professors also help to contribute to developing the curriculum which is important. And then of course the hands-on learning, real world experience informed by industry. I mean there's a lot of benefits to studying at a college and studying at George Brown specifically. Uh, we have over just slightly over 31,000 full-time students so we are which includes uh, about 5,500 international students and we are considered a large size college in, um, in, in Ontario. And the fact that our students come from so many different countries around the world just adds to the flavor and the uniqueness of our institution. Um, I, when I was a student at George Brown, um, I sat with uh, people in my classroom who came from different walks of life. Some came strict, uh, fresh from uh, high school. Some were people like myself who had worked for 10 years in different industries or different sectors and then we're coming back to college to uh, change careers so and then having people from different countries just adds to the um, the uniqueness of our programs because you learn with and from each other in the classroom uh, we offer over 170 full-time programs including eight honors degrees and as you can see by this slide, almost every one of our programs has been designed to fill the demand for jobs in specific careers. With many sector-specific programs to choose from, we prepare graduates with the skills and the knowledge they need for tomorrow's jobs. And that's the crucial thing. I mean, you can study theory in a classroom, uh, which is important because you we teach our students 
uh, the history of the subjects that they're learning about, <clears throat> as well as critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, and how the theory needed to do those jobs. But of course, you need to apply that theory in an in a experiential learning component or to be at a co-op or an internship because there's many different names of what we call the work experience that students get. That's the crucial thing is taking that theory and how do I apply that theory so that I can actually do the job, which is important. Now moving on to our campus locations, we are the only college with most of its locations in the heart of downtown Toronto, close to where many top companies have their headquarters. It's also where you find the financial district, top hotels, restaurants, hospitals, etc., which provides our students with access to top employers for their field education opportunities. Uh, we often say that the city becomes your classroom. So we're very fortunate and we love our location. Uh, we have over, as I told you, we have over 31,000 full-time students and they study out of our six urban locations and each location has been designed specifically for the programs that run there. Now, in addition to the locations going to go through uh, on the next couple slides, we also have a residence called The George for students who are coming from outside of the GTA, outside of Toronto, or from other countries. A fun fact is that this building was where the American athletes stayed during the 2015 Pan Am and Parapan Am Games. So this is a legacy building that was given to George Brown and then we uh, changed it into our um, residence. Uh, you can find information about the residence uh, on the George Brown website, but it, it really is a very nice thing. It's uh, set like an apartment, so you share your um, unit with uh, another roommate. You each have your own private uh, a room with a lock, but you share a little kitchen and a bathroom and a little living area, and there's kitchens on every other floors, and it's just a nice little hub for students to get to know each other. Moving on to the Casaloma campus, so this is one of our larger main campuses. This is where you will find programs in computer technology, construction and engineering, fashion and jewelry, dance, and general arts and science. Uh, we actually have two uh, fashion boutiques on our on this campus because that's where the fashion students actually get experience running a business if they want to one day become the manager of a fashion outlet or they want to uh, become a buyer to buy the clothes and the accessories for the for the uh, the business that they work in. So lots of great uh, and unique labs available at, um, at these campuses specifically to the programs that they uh, that run there. Moving downtown to the St. James campus, this is our other main campus. This is where you would find all the business programs, social and community service programs. Uh, we're actually one of the few colleges in Ontario that actually has a deaf and deafblind studies program. So we teach American Sign Language uh, in English if you want to be an interpreter. We actually have the first, uh, we've developed the first degree in Canada uh, for someone who wants to be an interpreter. Um, uh, St. James is also the home to our very popular School of Hospitality and Culinary Arts. We actually have, we're one of the biggest cooking schools in Canada. And we also have a restaurant across the street from the main building. That's where our students get their uh, hands-on experience in, a, in many areas working and running in that, uh, that restaurant. And we also have media programs, which for, um, for anyone wanting to get into video and sound uh, production, visual effects, um, that's part of this campus. And then English as a second language. We have many, many, many students that take uh, English as a second language or ESL uh, with George Brown. Moving on to the Ryerson campus, this is a building that we actually share with Ryerson University and uh, the only programs offered at this location are early childhood education. So if you want to teach young children, uh, we also, you'll see a, that uh, it says that we also operate 12 lab schools in Toronto. That means, lab schools actually means it's a child care center. Uh, where our students get uh, their practice working with kids. And um, just on a, a personal note, I have a daughter, and when she was little, she actually went to a George Brown daycare until she went to public school. So I can tell you as a mother, I was very impressed with the education my daughter got at such a young age. Now we're going to move down to the waterfront, and that's where we have our waterfront campus. And as you can see, there are two separate areas at the waterfront campus. The first area is the... Um, 
Health Sciences Building. So this is the Daphne Cockwell Center for Health Sciences, and this is where you would find all the health uh, programs. So dental health, health and we wellness, which includes our fitness and health promotion program. We're also one of the few schools that actually teaches hearing instrument specialists. So if you want to work sort of in an audiology field and do testing for someone who's experiencing hearing loss, uh, health management are the non-medical medical program, so if you want to do the administration side of health sciences. And we have our very popular nursing programs. I mean, we've put there that it, it, it is just domestic, but uh, we always like to talk about it because you never know. Some of our international students eventually become domestic students because they come to Canada and stay here. So we always want to tell you what your future options are. The other building at the Waterfront campus is our Daniels Waterfront City of the Arts. This is the new home for the programs that we're going to be covering uh, over the next uh, 45 minutes. So the School of Design moved down to this location in May of 2019. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful building with more than 100,000 feet. Of, of space where our students get to learn and uh, do work on innovative projects and they work with and around each other and there's a studio space as well as uh, exhibit space so it really is a fantastic space just for the students who attend there because remember we design our buildings specifically for the programs that run there so when you go hopefully you can go online we actually have uh, some campus tours that we do um, on our website, you can see the, the upcoming dates, and if you sign up for one of the Waterfront digital uh, virtual tours, we will actually walk you through and show pictures of this building, which is just fantastic. Um, uh, the next part phase of our Waterfront uh, campus will be an expansion with the addition of our um, the Arbor. So um, this is going to be Ontario's first mass timber building. And if you're not familiar with mass timber, it is a category of framing styles typically used uh, using large solid wood panels for wall, floor, and roof construction. Um, it allows the use of renewable and sustainable resources as an alternative to more fossil fuel intensive materials. And you can read more about this exciting project on the George Brown website. Uh, we're actually beginning, we're going to be moving a couple of our program areas down to this location, and we'll also be adding another childcare center. So. Um, this will be this won't be for a couple of years because construction is set to start next year, uh, but we're very excited about this new addition, to George Brown. For the next few minutes, I'm going to just cover the types of programs and credentials that are offered at George Brown or at any college in Ontario. So if you're not familiar with the different programs that we offer, so usually we offer one-year programs. Uh, they're called certificate programs, and they can give students an opportunity to test out a career or a subject area, <clears throat> or maybe to see what specialization they might have, they might enjoy, like um, students could take media foundation, or general arts and science and then they learn about those two different areas and it helps them decide where they want to pursue. Uh, certificates also give students uh, a preparatory year of academic studies to help them get into other programs. So an example would be um, if an applicant uh, is applying to graphic design for example and their portfolio does not meet the requirements to get into that program, they would benefit from taking the one year art and design foundation certificate where they can work on their technical skills to develop a stronger portfolio. So there's, uh, there's one year certificates that are good for someone to just test out an area or to get extra help in a certain area that maybe they're a little weak on. The uh, majority of college programs are offered in the two year and three year diploma uh, format. Uh, basically, two years give students all the core skills and knowledge they need to succeed in a specific job. But if they do the three-year advanced diploma, the three-year expands on those core skills and knowledge, but students get more work-integrated learning opportunities in the third year, like co-op, externship, capstone projects, which can often prepare graduates for entry-level management positions. And uh, the length of these programs are determined by the industry standards or the certification requirements required. 
For example, many undergraduate programs in the School of Design are three-year advanced diplomas because it usually takes that long to build the skills to be successful in those industries. So a lot of thought goes into deciding is a program going to be two-year or three-year. Now moving on to the next uh, type of program is the four-year honors bachelor's degrees. And uh, these are not new. Uh, Ontario colleges have been offering bachelor's degrees since 2002. And they include a solid foundation of theoretical knowledge as well as mandatory co-op field placement or work integrated learning opportunities so that students graduate with real world experience. Because some degrees that you study are more, um, they're not uh, career focused. So all of ours are, were designed to fill the demand for management level positions in specific sectors. So uh, you will not find a degree at a college in a subject like history or anthropology. We don't teach those. Ours are very specific to jobs. For example, we have in the School of Design, we have the Bachelor of Digital Experience Design degree, which involves the study of human behavior and human computer interaction. And students get experience by managing projects, testing emerging digital technologies, prototyping new ideas, and anticipating future trends. So they're very specific and they help students get um, into jobs. And in fact, there were some data that came out last year from Statistics Canada that reported that the graduates from college degree programs are earning 12% more than uh, students graduating just from these uh, subject-based uh, degrees from university. So uh, they're very worthwhile for students to pursue. The next programs that we offer are one-year graduate certificates. So the first four that I talked about, uh, you can apply directly from school or secondary school. You can have college, university, or have work experience. But the graduate certificates, students must have college or university and or workplace experience before they can apply to these programs. Uh, these programs build on the knowledge and experience gained through previous education or work. Sometimes they're in the, the same area of study uh, or in the case of interdisciplinary design strategy, which you're going to learn about uh, later on, um, they can be from very different forms. Like, uh, you can study something different than design and actually get into those programs. So they really build on and add to a person's experience and education to give them a well-rounded opportunity to, to pursue um, many uh, career paths. So a lot of university students will come take these programs because maybe they did do a program in university which is mostly theory and now they come back to a college because either they want to change to a different discipline or they want to add to their previous education and get some valuable co-op or work experience because remember at the end of the day employers are looking for education but they also want to see experience and many students take the graduate certificates at college because they're going to get that experience on top of it. So now I am going to uh, uh, narrow it down even more and just give you a quick little overview just of the George Brown School of Design. So uh, I'll let you sort of read through the bullets on the screen and I'll just uh, elaborate a little bit on some of them. Uh, leading edge curriculum. All of our programs have program advisory committees made up of college faculty and industry experts who ensure that our programs teach students what they actually need in order to work in the different sectors. So, you know, these programs, there's a lot of thought going into them, and leading edge curriculum means that if anything changes in the industry, we have to change the curriculum to make sure that the programs are delivering the outcomes that will get students hired. In these, in these jobs, in these areas of, of design. Uh, expert faculty, many of our instructors are part-time because they are actively involved in or working in design. So they bring relevant examples to the classroom. I mean, we have full-time professors as well, which are there to, to teach and as well as to mentor the students. But we purposely like to have part-time faculty teaching because they are out there right now doing those jobs and what better way to learn about a job than to be taught by someone who is in that job right now and they can actively tell students hey this is what I'm working on this week and they bring relevant current experience into the classroom. 
And then, of course, real world, world experience. This is what colleges are known for. Students are immersed into the world of design as soon as they start at George Brown, and they gain valuable and marketable skills through education, both in and out of the classroom. So, you know, we put a lot of thought into our programs to ensure that our students are, are getting what they need to get out there and start working in the industry. Speaking of industry, again, that we are constantly working on building relationships with our partners. Uh, and you can see overall over 500 partnerships at the co and, and major companies like maybe some of these names are not familiar to you uh, as international folks, but Rogers Media, Chorus, Ubisoft for gaming. I mean, there's so many. We don't have time to go through all the the uh, industries that uh, support George Brown and a lot of them like to hire our students because they have helped create the curriculum so they know that the graduates are going to automatically fit into their, uh, their companies. So it's a two-way street. They help us by building the curriculum and they also help us by providing our students with um, workplace opportunities, getting practice, capstone projects, and a lot of our students get hired by the companies where they uh, eventually work. Uh, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I was talking about that slide and I totally uh, was not on that slide and no one warned me. So <laughs> here is the, uh, the slide that I was talking to with the partnerships. Rogers Media, Ubisoft, Gameloft, uh, they're major companies in Canada and we're very fortunate that they support our programs and they support our students. So please, when you do have time, um, Matt has put links into the chat where you can go in and sort of like read about our industry partnerships on your own time because it is crucial to see that our programs are supported so strongly by the people who will be hiring our graduates at the end of their education. Uh, next, program requirements. So this is something that I'm going to quickly just tell you about. So there's 10 programs in the School of Design. We're not going to cover all of them today. We're only going to have time to cover four. But uh, the first one you see there is two semesters, and it's the Art and Design Foundation program that I was telling you about. It's a certificate program. And basically, admissions is just course-based. So when, I, uh, when it says course-based, it means that students need to have just English as a requirement, for example. Sometimes it's English and a math. So it's just course-based. But when you look at the examples of the, the next ones, the interaction design, the game art, and graphic design, you'll see the admissions is course-based plus something else. We call them supplemental. So it means first we look to make sure that you have the English component, and then we're going to ask you to do a questionnaire and submit a portfolio. So the admission requirements varies a little bit by program. Same thing when you see the uh, degree program. It's course-based, and then there's also a, a questionnaire portfolio. Now, when you look at the graduate programs, these are a little bit different in the sense that, remember I told you earlier in the slides, uh, students who apply to these programs must have a combination of uh, um, college or university, so they, they, it has to be more than just high school or secondary school, and it's a combination of work experience as well. And uh, any of these programs that you'll see on the screen will use a combination of education, work experience, portfolio, resume, uh, questionnaire, letter of intent. Basically, letter of intent is you tell us why you're interested in this program. We want to see what students are thinking about them. Uh, and online interviews. So again, admissions sometimes takes a little longer for design programs because it's not just looking to make sure that you have proof of uh, English. It's making sure that you have proof of English, but then there's going to be another step that we have to evaluate. So we also have people to, to be patient in dealing with these programs because um, there's an extra step and it takes longer to review portfolios and to read resumes and to look at questionnaires and then to do an online interview and there's scheduling involved. So you have to be patient when it comes to uh, advising your, stu your applicants or your clients about these programs. Uh, program pathways is very important uh, at the college level because uh, many students will start in one program and they have the opportunity to um, bridge or uh, apply to other programs in, in college. Specifically, these are examples for the School of Design. 
So you can see at the very top the one year art and design foundation program. Someone takes that to build their skills and they're going to learn about typography and color and design uh, principles. And then once they build a solid foundation and a really strong portfolio, they then can apply to the game art or graphic design or interaction design or the degree. And then from those programs, you'll see that there's pathways to get into um, that students can apply to get into the graduate programs like the digital design or concept art or interdisciplinary design strategy. Um, so again, there's many opportunities for students to transition from one program into another. And uh, again, it builds on the skills that you learn and you keep building on those skills and you get experience and, you know, the more you learn about a specific area, it just uh, enables you to be better prepared to get jobs in those different sectors. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good opportunities all around. And the fact that our programs have all been designed so that it's a seamless transition from one to the other makes it very easy for George Brown students in terms of adding on to their education. So that's going to be it for me for a while. I'm going to take a little break, and now I'm going to invite Nicole for our first program spotlight, which will be on graphic design. Take it away, Nicole. Hello, everybody. Good day. My name is Nicole Dimson. I am the coordinator of the graphic design program, as well as a professor. And on top of that, I'm actually a graduate of George Brown College back in the day when apples were things you ate and things that you didn't work on. So I ended up uh, working in many studios and was asked if I wanted to start teaching part time at George Brown, doing digital applications. And I jumped on it because I loved my experience at George Brown. And since then, which is over 20 years now, I've been teaching part time and last year became the coordinator of the program. So I want to share with you all the wonderful aspects about our graphic design program. I'm going to turn off my video now. You see what I look like, but this way we're not going to have any issues and we'll go from there. So it is a six semester, three year program. Um, the first three years, the first three semesters, you get your core strong foundation of everything you need to know into the world of design. And in the fourth semester, what's really wonderful at our school is you have a choice to be able to major in communication design or advertising and you're given all the basis before you make that decision as to what your major wants to be what but what makes George Brown College the most unique design college in Ontario and across Canada is that we have electives we have over 20 of them 24 design electives which allows you after you get your first three semesters under your belt you can start self-directing your own education if you know that motion graphics is what you want or if you want to get into editorial or packaging you have that opportunity to fill your schedule with these amazing electives in your final year, we make sure that you are completely prepared for the industry. We have a course called Professional Practice, which helps you develop your resume, your branding, put your portfolio together, not only digitally, but the hard copy to be able to go and see different uh, studios. We also have field placement, which is wonderful. So if you meet all the requirements within your course of professional practice, you are then matched up with a design company uh, that is going to work with where you want to find yourself in the world. So it's an amazing opportunity. And then your final big show or a big um, show in the world of design is are your thesis project. It's a large major project for you to be able to put all your design skills together and you're solving a problem. So that design piece that you walk out of, of George Brown along with all your other pieces puts you in a very strong position for you to be able to find work. And on top of that, we're really proud of our year end show because we have the industry coming. They're very excited to come and see our students work and see the incredible stuff they've learned over the three years that they've been there. And many of our students are plucked out of that year end show for work. One of the wonderful things, too, that we have going on at the, our school is this international component of charrettes, which are these incredible um, 
very intense few days where your design people are brought together all across all sorts of platforms and they're there to solve a problem. We have one in the fall where students go to Copenhagen and we have one with Brazil where they actually come to our school. And on top of that, we have this lovely, amazing four double credit course in Italy. It's a four week course and it's an incredible experience. Many of the students across all the arts uh, tend to go because it's such a great deal for them to be able to experience international study. So I'm gonna move us on and you can have a brief look at what our semesters are. You can see that these are the first three semesters and this is the first column on your left. That's where all our basis of all your core courses are. And then you decide to major in advertising or communication. You can see the courses listed below that you must take, but you can see that you have two design electives, as I mentioned, for each term. And that's when you have the choice of these wonderful electives for you to be able to self-educate yourself and get you to the area of design that you would like to be in. On top of that as well, one of the most important things that we've always done is to make sure what the industry needs, we make sure our students know. The biggest emerging trend right now is to make sure that all students have interactive design under their belt, and we've made it now a mandatory course, and the students are quite excited about moving into this new direction. On top of that as well, you can see they do prototypes by hand, they go into real depth of how do these apps work and how do we get them to function. We know that that is an important part. But on top of that, we also do two-dimensional design. We do right back to the beginning of print to make sure that typography and imagery and everything that's put together is beautifully done and the students are educated as to how to do that, as well as three-dimensional design, package of design, as well as interactive design, or excuse me, um, wayfinding design, if that, again, is that 3D world that you really love. I'm gonna move forward and speak to you a little bit about the uh, admission requirements. As mentioned by uh, Liz before, she mentioned that you will have a questionnaire that you have to fill out as well as a portfolio. And I'm just gonna quickly go over so you can feel a little bit comfortable as to what it's all about. The questionnaire, because everything is online right now, it's extremely important for us to feel and sort of hear your passion of why you want to be in this industry. So that's what these questions give us insight into you. What is your definition of design? Why do you want to be a graphic designer? Don't give us weird stories in the sense of, don't tell us what we think you want us to hear. Tell us really, give me you. I wanna see you in this stuff. I am someone who reviews many, many of the portfolios and I really do look at the questionnaire questions because it gives me insight into you. Um, who's your favorite designer or artist? Tell me why, why do you admire them? Give me something to feel that sort of excitement and that passion that's there. What are your favorite creative projects? It doesn't matter if it isn't a piece of design. If you designed an interior of a room, if you did landscape, if you did jewelry, just tell me why you loved it. Explain to me what was it within that creative process that uh, incited that passion? Do you lose yourself? Does the world go away when you're designing something? These are the kind of things, just tell me what it feels like for you to be creative. And then there are times that things we learned didn't go quite as planned, but how were you resilient? How did you work with it? Did you have a teacher tell you something you didn't like? Did you have a colleague? Did you have a friend give you criticism on it? How did you deal with it? What did you take away from it? How did you work with it? And this idea that design can be a force of change. Think about how design can change our world. And then if you really start thinking about it, doing a bit of research, design changes everything in the world. We know that design is such an important part to sort of change, help society change and move forward. So those are the questionnaires that you'll be asked. And then on top of that, you are gonna be asked to submit some of your work. I cannot stress this enough. For our school or any other school that you apply, please, please, please make sure that you read all the portfolio requirements very, very carefully. As you can imagine, many of the schools have hundreds and hundreds of applicants that we have to weed through. And one of the things that we do is if you don't 
give us everything that we've asked you for, you're going to be put down at the bottom of the pile. So for digital work, it can be photo manipulations and animations, illustrations, lettering, logos, identities, websites, technical drawings. You can see there's so much. Put some of your digital work in there. Make sure that you have something that has typography, a layout that combines those text and images. And again, you can see it's advertisement, magazine covers, brochures, posters, what have you. And this one is very, very important. Number three, please, please make sure that you give us your preliminary work when it comes to um, one of the pieces from above. We need to know that this is your work. Show us your sketches. You can photograph them, scan them in, whatever it is, but they must be supplied. And I will tell you in all honesty, that's a big one. If you don't supply us with your preliminary work on one of the pieces that we've asked for, again, sadly, you will be put down at the bottom of the list. And last but not least, traditional art, drawings, paintings, prints, sculptures, all of those wonderful aspects, again, shows us that you have a bit of an eye, that you can see, that you have some training in the background, that you've done some stuff in the arts before. So these are all the portfolio requirements. Near the end of the presentation, I'm going to go over with you uh, because all of these portfolios are pretty common to a lot of the different programs and I will show you the different ways on how you can uh, apply and upload your portfolios. Within our program you can see that upon graduation there are many areas that you can get into regarding your career and as I mentioned because you can self-educate yourself Perhaps wayfinding or environmental graphics is something that you fall in love with because of your class or interaction design or package design or motion graphics. We can get you there and you can see it's not just, oh my gosh, I don't have many options once I leave our program. You have a plentiful area that you can go into, which is really exciting. So if you have any further questions, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. And I'm always here to uh, give you insight or any other information that you desire. So I'm going to now pass you along to uh, Jean-Paul Amore, who is the coordinator and professor of game and art programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, I wanted to echo uh, all of my colleagues and welcome everybody to uh, George Brown College virtually. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the game art program, although I can tell you that uh, we do offer other game programs in uh, game programming, game design, and concept art. Uh, but uh, our focus today will be on uh, game art. And uh, in terms of the game art program, uh, this is a three-year, six-semester program, and it is an advanced diploma. Uh, very similar to the graphic design program, there is a specialization. So during the first year of studies, uh, students will focus on their core foundation uh, studies. And really what they're studying are 2D skills uh, in art. And uh, once they perfect their 2D skills, then in year two and year three, they focus on 3D skills. Um, there are specializations in two areas. So one is modeling and the other one is animation. And the courses will be set uh, based on the selection of uh, our students. So if uh, students specialize in modeling, there will be a series of modeling courses that the students are required to take versus in animation, there will be a similar uh, series of animation courses that students are required to take. Uh, we also offer field placement, uh, uh, and that's in the form of internships. Now, I'm going to discuss this in a few uh, slides from now uh, in more detail. But uh, in uh, our game art program, so uh, as I mentioned, during the first year, we focused on 2D skills. And you can notice from the courses that uh, they're primarily focusing on drawing, both digital and traditional. Um, and students will always have the opportunity to create art and then bring it into a game engine and see how it works, test it interactively. Finally, during the first year, students have uh, an introduction to modeling and an introduction to animation. Uh, those two courses really help students make the decision for their specialization. So uh, once they complete their first year, as I mentioned, they have to declare their specialization 
And if they choose modeling, uh, the courses that they will take are in the middle column, while if they choose animation, the courses that they'll take are in the last column. And uh, thematically in our modeling specialization during the second year, students focus on building environments, landscapes, buildings, while in our uh, third year, uh, our modeling students focus on building characters. So uh, whether they're human characters, creatures, and uh, once again, they have the opportunity to import all of this artwork, test it out in game engines. Um, for our animation students during our second year, students focus on the technical aspects of animation. So for example, building a skeleton for their characters, uh, using our motion capture facilities to uh, translate motion into animation. And uh, during uh, the third year, our animation students focus on more character animation, but this time it's uh, much more creative animation. So for example, experimenting with motion and uh, uh, cinematics as well. Um, it, during all uh, three years, our students can uh, f have an internship, so they can focus on uh, projects as well. Uh, before I chat about that one, uh, I wanted to uh, show you some of our uh, technology in our facilities. And uh, as uh, Liz mentioned earlier, we do have amazing facilities, brand new technology. Uh, you'll notice that we do have motion capture uh, facilities and we have two different motion capture systems. Uh, Accents, which is a sensor-based system, and that's uh, featured in the photo. Uh, we also have a Vicon system, which is a camera-based system. In our labs, we have uh, drawing tablets, uh, Wacom Cintiq tablets, and uh, we also have 3D printing facilities where our students can uh, create 3D models and print them. Uh, and finally, we have facilities for our students to play games, of course. Uh, we have a gaming room. Uh, we do feature our students, but uh, students also uh, play their console games. Uh, and uh, I uh, listed a couple of games. These are our last two photos on this slide. Uh, Rumbo is actually a game that you can purchase. And uh, one thing that's great is that uh, students that graduated from our program developed this game while they were in school. Uh, so as soon as they graduated, they um, uh, formed an agreement uh, to publish the game with Nintendo. And so now you can purchase uh, Rumbo on uh, any of the Nintendo platforms, as well as uh, on Xbox and uh, PS4. Um, for our field placement and our internship, students have the opportunity to work uh, on a game starting from their first year and uh, they can carry this through their entire studies. Um, in order to complete a field placement or an internship, students must complete 120 hours. Um, and uh, really students choose what they want to do when they're uh, completing an internship. So different opportunities that we offer our students. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we offer three other game programs at George Brown. And uh, all four of our game programs come together to develop games uh, throughout the year uh, with the intent of selling uh, those games. So uh, that is the example that I gave you of Rumbo. And um, this brings together students from all four of the programs at uh, different levels of education. So students could be in their first year and focusing on uh, building a game with other students in their program as well as in our other game programs. Uh, so that's one uh, field placement opportunity. Other field placement opportunities could be paid as well. And uh, those are in the form of research projects. So our students can uh, participate on research projects and work on projects with our uh, industry partners. Or they can work directly at studios. Um, and I've listed a few studios uh, where students either have uh, completed a field placement or are currently working. And uh, we do have a lot of students at Ubisoft Toronto. Um, in terms of applications, uh, similar to graphic design, uh, this program does have an application questionnaire as well as a portfolio. 
For the questionnaire, uh, we are looking to see uh, what level of experience you have in fine arts, but we also want to see what your knowledge is in games, um, not only uh, in terms of playing games, but also uh, the field or the industry of game development. So uh, we're looking at uh, what are your interests, what's your ideal company, uh, what positions would you uh, be interested in working in, as well as what are you interested in learning uh, from the Game R program. In terms of the portfolio submission, uh, we're looking for applicants to submit up to 10 pieces, and these can be a variety of pieces. We do favor that the majority are uh, life drawings or sketches, but they can also be paintings, sculpture, photography, any digital art, and of course, games or level designs. Um, our game programs are pretty proactive uh, in uh, the, the industry, at least in Toronto, but also internationally. Uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of outreach in Toronto in terms of events that we offer. And to give you some examples, uh, we do uh, host a series of uh, game jams which are 72-hour challenges where uh, participants uh, create and prototype a game. Uh, so basically, they, they don't sleep, they don't eat, they just develop games. And uh, finally, at the end of the 72 hours, they have a prototype uh, that is playable. Uh, so some of the uh, game jams that we host at the college, uh, TO Jam and uh, Global Game Jam, now, Global Game Jam is an international game jam, so uh, this is hosted in other cities in the world. But TO Jam is an exclusive uh, game jam uh, in Toronto, and uh, this one's been hosted for about 15 years. So uh, during the last TO Jam, we had uh, inwards of 550 participants. That's a lot for a game jam. Uh, we've also participated in uh, international game jams, and uh, one of them we participated in uh, Italy, Milan, and uh, uh, it was the International Game Camp where uh, both our students and students from an Italian uh, institution were able to join forces to uh, prototype games during the game jam. Uh, students also participate in competitions, and uh, last week we received news that uh, five of our students uh, uh, placed in the top three uh, for the Ubisoft Toronto Next competition. And uh, the Ubisoft Next competition uh, allows uh, participants to submit uh, 3D models, animations, concept art. And uh, the participants that are shortlisted, top three will uh, win an internship, a full-time internship at Ubisoft. So uh, the five students from George Brown that placed uh, will be working at Ubisoft, I believe, starting at the end of the month, which is an amazing opportunity. Uh, and finally, uh, our students participate in the IGDA uh, scholarship program. IGDA is the International Game Developers Association. So this is an international organization of game developers. And they host uh, scholarship uh, opportunities for um, participants. Participants have to submit uh, a questionnaire, very similar to uh, the questionnaire actually that we have to enter our, our uh, game art program. And uh, winners of that scholarship get to participate in some of the biggest game conferences in the world. And we've had quite a few uh, winners of that scholarship. So once again, we're very proud of uh, the successes of our students. Um, upon graduation, uh, there are many different jobs that our uh, students can uh, enter, um, anywhere from uh, 2D art to 3D animation and uh, 3D environment development, 3D character development, or 3D animation, uh, cinematic animation. Uh, but um, besides all of these job opportunities, I think it's really important to also understand that uh, game development is a multidisciplinary uh, skill, and the skills learned in the program could carry into other industries. Uh, some of the more popular industries that our students um, will uh, work in, if it's not in the game industry, 
are in film, so uh, animation studios definitely consider our students. But we're starting to see some new jobs that are emerging. So, for example, in architecture, architectural visualization does require modeling and 3D uh, modeling in particular. So uh, quite a few of our students uh, do work at architectural firms doing 3D visualization. So I encourage uh, anyone that's interested in games to also keep an open mind that there are other areas that uh, you could focus on. Um, now I'm going to pass the mic to Anna Rita Morais, and she is the chair for the School of Design. Anna Rita. Thanks, JP. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to turn on my video so that I could say hi to everybody. Um, I am Anarita Mores, as JP said, Chair for School of Design. Uh, I oversee the 10 programs across the School of Design and I get to be the sort of liaison between the faculty and uh, the students. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the Design Management Program, so G401. Um, our coordinator for the program, uh, formerly Judith Gregory, uh, has retired as of the last two weeks. And so we are transitioning towards a new um, coordinator named Tony Allen, but uh, for today I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the program. So the design management program is one of five other postgraduate programs here at the college. Uh, the, the actual program itself is geared at preparing students for careers in managing design strategically. And that includes uh, across design studios, across architecture firms. Um, we have a sort of wide array of students who come whose family owns a business and they'd like to take over that business and they have quite a bit of design acumen and what they're looking for is a bit of business and strategy. Uh, so the program helps build on these skills in order to help students achieve some of these business and uh, strategic objectives. Uh, so again, in, in line with also teaching business skills, we also look at sort of uh, overarching leadership skills uh, and business strategy. So the program deals is sort of ideal for design professionals that have a bit of a global perspective. So those that would uh, ideally like some work experience in Canada, but also would like to transcend some of those skills back home uh, or abroad and to sort of apply them in a sort of uh, global context. Uh, we see these also as opportunities for students that are already working in the field or have some work-based experience that are coming back essentially to sort of uh, flex some of that business and management acumen. And uh, one of the sort of selling points of the program is that students have an opportunity to do a field placement. Uh, and I think that that really helps them build a bit of their entrepreneurial skills, but also teaches them how to work in strategic design environments. Uh, so just some sort of selling features around the program. Uh, there's no other programs uh, like this globally. Um, in Canada, there is one other sort of uh, competitor, but it's actually just a continuing education course at Ryerson in the Chang School. Uh, so there's no other programs, again, that have an opportunity for uh, two semesters to focus on something and then also to have that added field placement. Uh, in terms of employment rate, 75% uh, of our students find work in this area. Uh, the average starting salary is about 43,000 Canadian dollars. Uh, as Liz mentioned, uh, all the faculty that teach in the program are actively involved in the industry. So it means that they're either running their own studios or they have a lengthy history of working in a studio-based environment. Uh, akin to all of the programs at the School of Design, we work with a program advisory committee, which is essentially composed of a series of thought leaders, uh, industry leaders, uh, folks that are really working in the field who help us guide our curriculum. So we meet with our PACs each uh, twice a year, and essentially they offer us feedback on trends, on skills that graduates uh, should have. And so we really make sure that we work those things into the curriculum so that the students are ready to hit the ground running when they leave the college. Uh, in terms of recruitment, so this program is actually quite heavily international. Um, it's basically 95% international students and 5% domestic. And uh, the interesting thing about the program is that we get students from the four corners of the world. Um, so as uh, this past year, we had a student from Chile, uh, a significant amount of students from Iran, uh, many students from India, some students from China, uh, a couple students from the United States. And so it gives us an opportunity not only to bring our lived experiences into the classroom, but also to approach design from a sort of multidisciplinary uh, and global perspective. <clears throat> 
And then uh, the big selling feature for the program tends to be that there is a mandatory field experience. So students get to go work uh, across various studios and field placements in the city. So program courses, so I won't go into covering these into too much detail, but I think that one of the reasons I wanted to include this slide is so that you get a sense of how diverse the actual range of programming is. So we're looking at everything from business uh, communications to design research, to sort of managing projects, to focusing on creativity and branding, uh, and then really focusing in on finances and design strategy. Uh, the program sort of is benefited by the fact that it works closely with other postgraduate programs, particularly uh, the Interdisciplinary Design Strategy Program, which my colleague Nazanin will talk about shortly. But the idea is that we work on similar charrettes, we uh, sort of have very similar approaches to programming, and I think that that gives us an opportunity to, again, work in larger teams and to understand team dynamics a bit closer. So this is just the second semester, and again, you see that the big priority for the second semester is looking at case studies, really focusing in on uh, what it means to be a design leader, and then a major project which the students conduct independently focused on their own research and their own insights. And then again, that mandatory 120 hour uh, field placement. So just talking a little bit about that field placement uh, so that students have a sense more of what it does. Uh, so it occurs in the second semester. We spend a significant amount of time in semester one preparing students with portfolio skills. Uh, so again, we give them tips on uh, how to write their resume, how to sort of, uh, you know, put themselves into their cover letter in a way that's very clear for the employer so that the employer understands what the student is endeavoring to do in their field placement. And then we also prepare them with things like mock interviews uh, so that by the time they sit down with the prospective employer, they have a solid sense of how to talk about themselves and their narrative in the design world. Um, so again, the field placement happens over 120 hours. Uh, so it's usually five weeks, but we can spread that out uh, or make it, a, um, you know, a kind of last a bit longer depending on what the employer's needs are. Um, I can tell you that in the time of the current pandemic, many of these field placements moved uh, to a remote uh, opportunity. So lots of our students had an opportunity not only to work within the studio, but then to transition into an online environment. And I think that that actually gave them a significant experience into transitioning online in the way that many, many, many of us have had to do. So I think that it added a sort of additional skill set to be able to project manage and to work closely with a team from abroad. Um, so students come from a variety of design backgrounds. Uh, this year I had the opportunity to review all of the applicants that have applied thus far. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, even in that short list that you see there, fashion, graphic design, interior design, architecture, UX, UI, the list is uh, far more pronounced. So for example, we had students who had backgrounds in chemistry that were applying to the program, but they had sort of worked in an environment uh, that wasn't traditional to their educational experience and they wanted to develop a bit more business and uh, management acumen. And so we do take students that don't necessarily fall within those design backgrounds, uh, so long as we can see that there's a demonstrated need for them to be in the program. Um, so the actual internships themselves are geared towards the students uh, expertise and what the employer themselves need. Um, so just to give you a, an idea of where some of our students have been placed in the last couple of years, uh, Moriyama Toshima, so big architecture firm that's actually working on the Arbor, the building that uh, was discussed by Cindy earlier, sorry, by uh, Liz earlier, is one of the uh, field placements our student had. Um, we have students that get placed at Bruce Mao Design every year, um, students that get placed at smaller sort of retailers as well. And so there is really uh, pending what the students needs are, that's where we'll place them. So admission requirements, I think I just want to talk about this a bit briefly because akin to all of the other programs, we do have supplementary requirements for design management. So again, the credentials are, are uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory there. Uh, so we have, again, uh, either a diploma or a bachelor's degree or some competency that's demonstrated through work experience. So again, if your uh, credential is in computer science or chemistry or anthropology, uh, but you are working in a sort of um, environment that allows you to manage folks or to work uh, at least at arm's length with designers, then uh, certainly you'd be qualifying for a application. 
Uh, the CV and resume. So I think that it's important to include all of the experience that you've done there. Um, I know lots of folks that are, are applying for programs or applying for jobs, they tend to leave things out that they think aren't important. So for example, uh, any student that has been a camp counselor or sort of a leader at um, their respective school, uh, students tend to leave that out because they think they don't see it as professional experience, but I would suggest including it because I think it gives, uh, you know, us at the sort of uh, adjudication side an opportunity to look at what kinds of management skills do you already have, what kinds of things are important to you, uh, you know, are you confident to work in an environment and to lead, I think those things are important. So um, if you're doubting whether or not you should include it, my suggestion is to include it, I think that that's important. Um, the portfolio, so the portfolios range quite significantly. Obviously, someone whose uh, background is in graphic design versus computer science versus photography uh, versus tattoo artists who even apply to the program, uh, your portfolio is going to look very different. What we ask is that you include five pieces uh, that are sort of related to your respective field, and then you provide us with a description of each. So it's not enough just to have a photo. Because um, for one, it doesn't actually let us know if, if uh, the work was created by you or if it was done in a team setting, for example. And those descriptions really help us to understand what your process was in the pursuit of creating that. So I think that that's a really important part. Um, the final piece, which is the letter of intent, is something that I really want to focus on. Um, as someone who's read about 60 of them in the last four weeks, uh, the letter of intent really should be describing what you intend to do in coming to the program. So typically I find that students have uh, sort of, they talk a little bit about their own background, which is great, but mostly there are things that are focused on the CV. And I think that what that doesn't do is give me a sense of who you are and why coming to this program is going to help you in your career path and your career trajectory. So what we want to see is really a demonstrated uh, focus on choosing the design management program, why you feel the courses are going to benefit you in terms of where you intend to go with your career, and overall just what you intend to get out of the program, right? And so typically students will uh, leave three or four uh, sentences for that at the end of their letter of intent, and then I haven't really learned why they're picking this program as opposed to any other program. So I think it's important to sort of weave a bit of your narrative, who you are, what background you have, um, and really I think that the letters that sell themselves the best to me are the ones that demonstrate that the student has some curiosity and that's why they're coming to the program. We don't expect students to come in with a, a breadth of knowledge around business and design, um, but I think it is important to know that you're curious and that you're coming to uh, the college with some openness to learning. Uh, and finally, the interviews. So the interviews for the design management program uh, tend to be optional, so we really only invite a candidate for an interview if we're quite stuck on understanding um, where they're coming from. And really, I think that that interview is used as an opportunity to really manage the student's expectations as well. So uh, I reserve interviews, for example, for a student that is applied that I actually think is better suited for, let's say, the interdisciplinary design strategy program and their interactive media management program. Um, and so I like to have a conversation with them to understand, hey, I think that maybe you're geared more towards this. Have you applied for this program? Or maybe you should consider applying for it. Uh, so graduate employment, obviously we know that this is uh, huge in terms of uh, figuring out where a student wants to go and, and I know that this plays into many of uh, the decision making plans for students. Uh, so graduates from our program, they offer up a little bit of a, a breadth of knowledge in the field. Uh, typically they're regarded as strategic designers, multidisciplinary design and design project managers. Um, so we can see typically when they leave us, the jobs that they get are sort of in line with these areas or in consultancy. Uh, graduates will go on to careers managing design in the corporate sector in a design consultancy or within their own businesses. Again, George Brown College is, is heavily focused on entrepreneurship, uh, and I think that we'll see a lot more of that in the coming years as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, students have acquired full-time employment at various design studios, architecture firms, and consultancy firms. And I think that what makes um, our graduates flexible and agile is that they do have that multidisciplinary approach based on the tools and methodologies they've learned across the curriculum. So that is it for me. Again, thank you for your time and your interest in the design management program. I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague uh, Nazanin, who is the academic coordinator for the interdisciplinary design program across the college uh, that is housed within the In Institute Without Boundaries. Thank you, Anarita. 
Uh, sorry, I was just turning on my video. Um, so my name is Nazanin Hamayim Far. I'm the program coordinator of the Interdisciplinary Design Strategy Program, and uh, I also lead a few of the courses um, during the year. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Institute Without Boundaries, um, the IDS program, and some of the uh, outcomes um, in terms of graduation outcomes um, coming from the program. Uh, so, the Institute Without Boundaries is actually uh, an internationally recognized design think tank based out of the School of Design at George Brown College. Um, it houses divisions. Um, one is the Special Projects Division that works on, uh, that works on consulting projects with uh, public and private partners, as well as the nine-month um, interdisciplinary design strategy program. And there's often overlap between different divisions. So many of the people who work in the special projects um, uh, are faculty and mentors um, in the IDS program, um, but they also uh, throughout the year help our students achieve kind of their final deliverables um, and mentor them throughout the process. So the interdisciplinary design, uh, whoops, sorry. The interdisciplinary design strategy program, uh, as I mentioned, the nine months postgraduate certi certificate offered through the School of Design at George Brown College. Um, what's really unique about the program is that it's always adapting to um, industry trends and um, we always bring in projects that are relevant to a real world problem or challenge that our students endeavor to solve. Um, the program is really uh, collaborative in nature. All of our students um, come from different design, uh, different backgrounds and disciplines and they have to work together throughout the year to respond to that specific um, design challenge that they're given. The program consists of core courses and complementary modules. Um, so we call them modules because they are shorter um, in time span and they're very um, tangible. So uh, whereas the core courses are um, research and theory based in the first semester, first semester specifically, um, the modules are more tangible design, uh, design uh, uh, outcomes. Um, so as I mentioned, our students all come from different backgrounds and disciplines, and this is really, um, really diverse. So they come from traditional design disciplines, so interior design, communication design, accessories design, urban planning and uh, graphic design, um, architecture. Um, but we also have students coming in from humanities or social sciences, so political science, global studies, sociology. Um, and those students who are kind of, we call them career shifters because they're, um, they're more mature students, they're looking for a second career and they might have experience with design um, and they're interested in it but they want to learn more um, without really becoming specialized in one field so they decide to take the program um, to kind of get that general understanding of design thinking and human-centered design um, so they can come from you know business administration health sciences um, human kinetics IT um, this is kind of a profile of our students in 2019-2020 which typically um, most of our students from these diverse um, backgrounds and disciplines. Um, so at the institute, at the IDS program, um, we're really dedicated in uh, coming up with projects that are relevant to uh, what's happening in the society or around the world, and specifically using uh, design thinking and human-centered design approaches to solve a specific given challenge. Um, so our students are typically uh, working with a partner throughout the year um, to uh, to look at the design challenge that they're given, um, and they deploy some of these uh, different um, uh, different methodologies uh, to solve that problem. So multidisciplinary and human-centered design, um, really that's kind of at the core of our program. Uh, multidisciplinarity comes from the way our students are recruited um, all the way through the way they um, they come up with their project solutions. Um, throughout the year, we have different workshops where we bring in uh, stakeholders, um, students from different disciplines from across the college, around the world, um, to work with our students. So, um, so we really make sure that our students have that diversity of uh, perspectives and backgrounds um, to help them uh, with, their, with their given challenge. Um, design thinking and research, um, it happens throughout the year. Um, our students spend a majority of the first semester doing design thinking and research to come up with the questions and um, insights that they need to tackle the project. Um, they use systems thinking and strategic for, uh, foresight to make sure that their insights um, are responding to the problem that they're, that they're trying to solve. Um, and it culminates in what we call design 
action, which is really coming up with tangible projects and solutions um, that can be, you know, piloted across a city um, or in various contexts. Um, so these are some of the co uh, these are the courses that we offer. Um, our program is nine months because it runs from end of August until beginning of June, um, and it's two semesters. Uh, so we have major project preparation and major project development, which runs across both semesters, and this is where the core um, research and design solution um, aspect comes in. Um, we also have these modules, as I mentioned, which which are three to six weeks long, um, and they're more tangible um, instances uh, of the major project so uh, all of these courses are integrated with the major project to make sure that they are supporting the um, thesis work that's happening in major project um, we also have uh, different courses teaching our students design research um, design process um, as well as various charrettes uh, which are uh, really intense um, design workshops um, to help our students test their leadership and facilitation skills um, so we have one charrette in the fall semester uh, which is more internal uh, with our students um, as well as design management or interactive media management students and this is really where they kind of figure out their teamwork and dynamic um, and then we have two other charrettes in second semester um, which uh, this the charrette two is more an international charrette where we have students coming in from um, from organizations from around the world, uh, so Kea in Copenhagen, uh, Otis in the United States, um, Milan, uh, Politico, Politecnico di Milano uh, from Milan, um, and they, they come to Toronto to our college to work with our students. Um, and then we have the production charrette, which happens in April, and that's more about um, produce, producing content and the final design deliverables. Um, so our, our program also uh, offers the work experience placement course, um, which is uh, kind of uh, sometimes it's a field placement and portfolio development. So really trying to get our students to understand the outcomes of this program and how they can um, put their skills to work in a real life design studio or consultancy firm um, or working with the public sector. Um, so future ways of living, uh, I'm not going to delve too much into this, but uh, our program usually has five year thematics and within those five years each year our students are looking at a specific design challenge uh, or problem. So Future Ways of Living started from 2018 to 2023 um, and it's looking at some of the, uh, it's looking at tackling our mo most pressing global issues, shaping our society, so trying to understand what are some of the trends that are going to impact the way we live and how can we design solutions that respond to those trends. Um, to make sure that we're anticipating a problem rather than waiting for it to happen um, and then, you know, design the solution for it as it happens. Um, so each year uh, our students will be looking at a specific um, topic related to this thematic. Um, we also have a pathway and partnership uh, with uh, a college in uh, uh, Dunleary, Ireland. So uh, what's unique about our program is that um, once our students spend the nine months uh, and they get their degree from George Brown College, they have the option of applying to the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dunleary, Ireland, um, where they can spend an extra five months working on an individual thesis and they will get um, a Master in Design for Change um, in addition to the IDS postgraduate certificate that they receive from um, from uh, from GBC. Um, so this, uh, what's unique about this uh, master's is that our students uh, will get a chance to test all the skills that they learned in the program um, on an individual research um, and thesis topic and that they will be ending uh, at IIDT. Uh, so. Our program actually has many pathways that our students can take because they have very um, diverse uh, disciplines coming into the program and they uh, get a set of a diversity of skills during the program. Um, they can choose to uh, pursue a career in traditional design studios, um, technology sector, non-for-profits, private organizations, uh, or pursue their own um, uh, entrepreneurship and open their own consultancy. Um, and typically the areas that they end up working in is service design, communication design, planning, design strategy, education 
application design, user experience design, design research, or project management and facilitation. Um, so as you can see, our students end up working in um, a diversity of uh, organizations, either in Toronto uh, or uh, internationally. So we've had students working with the City of Toronto or with Fjord in Dublin. Um, it really depends on where they want to end up. And during the program, we help them kind of achieve those uh, career goals that they have and uh, mentor them to find a specific job in that sector that they're interested in. Um, so I'm going to talk to, to you a little bit about that mission requirements. It's similar to the design management uh, program. So uh, uh, the students will need to submit a transcript um, once they pass that first level of um, admissions. Um, I'll be getting in touch with them uh, to submit their application questionnaire, um, which will include a link um, to their resume portfolio, two letters of references. Um, once they submit this questionnaire, I will reach out to them to schedule an interview. Uh, with myself and a colleague to kind of talk it, to them a bit more in detail about their career goals and where they want to end up and why they want to take our program. Um, so the applicant questionnaire is going to ask them for the uh, contact information of their references um, as well as their educational and professional backgrounds. Um, some of their goals, so uh, why they want to take this program and uh, where they want to end up afterwards, learning objectives, um, what they want to get out of the program, um, and kind of their personal attributes, so some of their skills and experiences and how they can help us in the interdisciplinary design strategy program. In terms of the portfolio, because our students will come from different design uh, the, from different disciplines um, that are not technically uh, design, uh, they can submit any kind of uh, piece of portfolio that showcases their skills um, with a kind of uh, rationale as to why they're including that piece. So for example, I've put here design assets, but this can include any kind of architecture renderings, graphic design, 2D or 3D um, work, um, if they're from you know, game design or uh, you know, uh, interaction design, they can showcase wireframes or um, samples of uh, samples of, you know, um, if they've developed an app. Um, I've included writing and essays. Uh, if they are from uh, backgrounds that are, you know, more humanities or social sciences, they can include pieces of their writing and work so that we can test their, we can see their research and writing skills, case studies, if they've worked on a specific project that they want to and they can include those, um, videos, any project management assets that they've done that they think would be relevant. Um, and, uh, you know, we really want to see uh, how the students could bring the skills that they're showcasing in the portfolio to our program um, because, you know, our program is very small. Uh, we usually have very small cohorts, so we want to make sure that uh, the skills of the students complement each other and that they're also able to kind of transfer their knowledge and skills to each other. Um, so that's it for me. If you have any more information, feel free to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to answer any more questions you may have. I'm going to pass it off to uh, Liz to talk to you about admission requirements for international applicants. Thank you. Thank you, Nazanin. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the information about the, all of these programs. Even though I work for George Brown, I always learn something new when I hear the professors and coordinators speak about them. Uh, I'm now going to cover just brief information about uh, international, uh, international admission requirements. And remember, for specifically to the School of Design, we said that there's more than just the proof of uh, English proficiency. So generally, international applicants have to be at least 18 years of age or older at the time of registration. And again, having graduated from senior secondary school or remember for the graduate programs, they must have college university and sometimes work experience as well of that. Uh, proof of uh, uh, English proficiency, if English is not the first language in your country, and I have some examples on the next slide. And then meeting any additional country specific and or credential requirements, which uh, I'm going to show you on our website where you can find this information. And there is a $95 non-refundable uh, application fee that people must submit in order to make their um, application proceed to the next uh, stage. And as you can see from here, the proof of um, English proficiency, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I'm sure most of you hopefully are familiar with all these uh, um, 
the IELTS and TOEFL and all those uh, acronyms there, but uh, new uh, this year is Duolingo. And if you're not familiar with Duolingo, it's the most popular language learning platform and the most downloaded educational app in the world. They have about 300 million users. And the, uh, the English test that they provide is a language proficiency tool designed for international students and institutions. And it offers uh, uh, English proficiency scores, video interview, writing sample in an accessible, efficient, and secure testing experience. And because we cannot do in-person testing, for any of our students, it's crucial to make sure that we have all these online um, opportunities available for people. Um, again, if you go to georgebound.ca, you'll see that our main menu has a, a tab for international. You, you click on there and you scroll down to future students, then move your cursor button over to admission requirements, and then that'll take you to a full page that shows you everything that you need. Because remember, there's uh, information on how to apply, life at George Brown, working in Canada, but most importantly, it's the requirements by country of origin. So you, there's a drop down menu to choose the country, and then there's also a drop down menu beside it for the credential. Because remember, if you're doing uh, undergraduate diploma certificate, the degree, or the postgraduate programs, it can be a little different. So everything is available on our website to ensure that our um, international students and agents can find the information that they need. Uh, the next slide is about the divisional select uh, process, which I'm going to invite Nicole back to talk about these next couple of slides. Hello again, everybody. It's Nicole, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, how to submit your portfolios. So there are a number of different ways that you can do it. I cannot stress this enough. No matter which way you do it, please make sure it's unlocked <laughs> and that we have access to it. So if you have a Google Drive, you can put your imagery on that. You can see here's an example right now of a student and it's sort of titled as to what they are, advertising, business cards, self-portraits, logos, et cetera, et cetera. That is one way that you could supply the work through your Google Drive. But as I mentioned, just make sure it's unlocked and we can get into it. Another way as well, someone, if you want to put your whole portfolio together as a PowerPoint presentation, please feel free to do so. Again, something that you could put on your drive that we get access to is one way you can do it. And for some people, they'll use a uh, sort of free website like Wix or what have you and, and use that themselves and put a website together very quickly. You can certainly do that. That's definitely an option for you. And as well, this one scrolled. So this was the beginning of a student's work and it scrolled down on the left and just kept going down, 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 down. And you know, either way, any way, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that we can see your work, make sure that we can actually understand your work. So title it, give it a bit of a description. It will just help us in the long run. So as mentioned, there are many, many different ways that you can do it. And there you go. So Liz, back to you. Thank you so very much, Nicole. So if you have any questions about the programs, uh, as the presenters were going through their slides, and uh, hopefully we will be able to post their information again, their contact information, because remember, you contact the speakers that we have today about the programs, but if you have questions specific about admissions, please don't email them. We have a recruitment specialist, and it's by country. So again, how to find that information? You go to our website, or we're going to post this URL so you can just have a quick uh, uh, um, click and find. But you'll see that there's also um, how to contact International Center. Uh, they have a, a virtual service desk that's available. And also, you can actually uh, have a, see the drop down menus because remember, we do have specialists that work specifically with different countries and they also speak different languages. So don't email the, the program uh, people for admission questions, please. There's a, 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 just a, an amazing team of people who are available to assist with that. Um, so thank you for um, sticking with us. We went a little bit over time. And now we're going to open it up for questions. So if you would like to go to your chat function, and uh, we will wait a few minutes to see if anybody has any questions. 
and uh, we will answer them as much as we can. And we also were recording this session, and it will be available to email all of our participants so that you can go back and watch it again and maybe take some more detailed notes if you want to because we do tend to go quite quickly. So we'll now open it up for questions. This is the part where it gets a little quiet because we're waiting for everybody to type in their questions. And also feel free that if you don't, uh, if you're pressed for time, um, you can also email us your questions and we can uh, email you back with uh, a, a, a reply. Because we know that some of you have um, other op um, obligations that you have to go to work, to school, etc. So please feel free to email us if you have any questions and you don't feel like writing them in this um, session. Um, also, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, hopefully this delivered all the information that you were hoping to get about George Brown, about the School of Design, and some basic information that would be helpful for applying uh, into these programs. Okay, so here's our first question from Gustavo. Um, first of all, it was a great presentation. I was thinking, if I choose the three-year game art program, can I work while I study? So we're going to ask uh, John Paul to answer this one, please. So typically, I wouldn't recommend uh, working too much, but uh, yes, definitely students do work while uh, they're attending the program. Uh, another recommendation that I could make is that uh, it be work in the field, and we do have students that work in the field while they're uh, studying. Yeah, some of our programs are so complex and in-depth Sometimes there's not, uh, you don't have time to have a full-time job while you're attending school. But uh, I was a George Brown student and I worked part-time while I was attending uh, my program. <laughs> Hi, Liz. Sorry, this is Teresa from International. Hi. Uh, the International Recruitment uh, Assistant for Europe and the Americas. And uh, in regards to Gustavo's question, um, I would like to say that international students are eligible to work up to 20 hours per week during the studies and full time during the scheduled breaks from the school. Excellent. Thank you, Teresa. Okay. We'll just give it a few more minutes to see if anyone else has any other questions. And if you don't have any questions, just let us know. If you enjoyed the presentation, you know, we've, we uh, value any feedback we get from our participants because that's how we um, work. Just like our programs have uh, feedback to make them better, we also w uh, are open to feedback to make our presentations and sessions run a little better. So please feel free to tell us uh, what you thought of today's presentation. By all means, we are, we are open to any suggestions. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, there we go. So uh, Cindy has opened up the microphone, but um, just so we don't have everybody talking at the same time, if you maybe want to use that little icon with the person with the raised hand, if you want to verbally say your question, maybe put your hand up and then uh, so we don't have people talking at the same time. Oh, here, okay, here's a question. In response to COVID-19, how do you teach in School of Design, online and physically mixed in September? Um, maybe Anna Rita can address that one, please. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so I think that for uh, many students or prospective students, folks that are returning back to class, those folks that are transitioning out of uh, high school and into university and college settings, we're all thinking about the same thing, which is, you know, how can we best possible uh, foster and cultivate a learning environment 
in a totally new world. And so it's something that our faculty uh, have been thinking a lot about. Um, they're working pretty diligently right now on prepping things for the fall. Uh, we had the last four weeks of the semester transition online. Uh, I mean, I can share that it certainly wasn't perfect, uh, but that we are going to take a lot of that knowledge and iterate. So one of the things that is challenging, obviously, in an online environment is to ensure that you have that same interactivity with students. And so we're focusing a lot more on deliverables and evaluations and activities during that scheduled class time that can enable students not only to learn from their instructors, but to learn from each other. And I think that the world of design is, is, uh, is you know, certainly agile and flexible enough that it can be moved online. We're seeing uh, lots of programs across colleges and universities not be able to run because they require very special labs or they require, um, you know, to, to work with uh, patients, for example. But with design, we're able to translate so much of the digital onto the online environment. And so I think that uh, that in anticipation of the fall, you know, again, we have the summer term where we're already iterating some of these uh, teaching concepts and methodologies. And what we want to ensure is that we're sort of being quite inclusive because we realize that many of the learners across the School of Design will learn in very different ways. And so it's important for uh, all of our instructors to sort of capture how best to reach uh, the widest possible audience. And so we're working quite diligently on that. And I think that it's a great question. And uh, we look forward to showing you how committed we are to that, uh, that education and to the learning outcomes of each program. Thank you, Anna Rita. And uh, I think also uh, going through this pandemic has changed the world of work for a long term. There may be companies that are going to um, maybe just have their workers uh, working from home permanently. So having some experience and getting used to online formats, I think, will be beneficial to every student who attends any college or university because I think moving into the future, some of us may be working remotely from home and being immersed in this digital virtual world. So um, I, I, as a former student, I, I hope students will learn, uh, will gain that you're still going to get the critical thinking skills and problem solving skills that you would get in person, but just delivered virtually. Anyone else have any other questions before we wrap it up here? I'm going to say thank you for attending. Um, you've, uh, we've now reached our hour and a half mark, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, remember, we do have information on our website uh, for international students on how and when to apply. So uh, someone's going to post the link there. And remember, if you have any questions, peel, uh, please feel free to email us at any point, because as uh, sometimes happens, with these presentations, you think of the question after the session is over, uh, but you can email us at any time and we will be more than happy to get back to you with, uh, with, our, um, with an answer. So on behalf of everyone today, uh, thank you very much for attending and I hope everyone has a pleasant day and stay safe during all this. Thank you. <laughs>